Okay, um, thank you for joining me. Welcome to the first uh, informational session for the 2022 annual town meeting. Uh, this is um, an opportunity for residents to get some information about how we create our budget, how we create the warrant, how we get to basically how we prepare for town meeting and go over some of the articles, go over the budget, um, and really give an opportunity for people to ask any questions that they might want to have, get an answer to prior to town meeting, or you know maybe they are uncomfortable speaking at town meeting. So this is a little bit of a more informal setting. Um, so feel free to jump off mute, write something in the chat, interrupt me at any time. I'm gonna try to keep this a little bit higher level and brief. Um, unfortunately, you know when you start talking about budget, it gets kind of dense. Um, so I'll, I'll somewhat jump through it, but this PowerPoint is available on the hot.org on the annual town meeting page. And this will be, this is being recorded. So this video and me talking through the PowerPoint will be available to starting tomorrow. And I will do another one of these info sessions on when, uh, Monday night at 6.30, Monday night at 6.30. Um, again, same thing, hybrid version here in the town hall and available online. So this year's uh, town meeting is in the town hall. Uh, it's, it's check in. I have it here it says starts at 11 a.m. It's, it's probably 11.30 a.m. is when check in will actually start. Certainly people can come ahead of that. But at 11.30, the poll checkers will be there giving out bracelets. Uh, giving out clickers. Uh, we're still uh, going back and forth about whether masks are going to be highly encouraged or required. We will have masks available um, either way. Uh, certainly, we are going to have a ton of air circulation and a number of air purifiers, and we're trying to create the most safe space possible. Uh, but we are back inside the town hall on Saturday, May 21st. Um, also, back this year, for the first time in a while, the uh, Council on Aging, the friends of, of, the, of the Tiffany Room, the friends of Council on Aging will be selling hot dogs uh, downstairs during the meeting. So if anyone gets hungry, bring cash. Uh, they will be selling hot dogs downstairs. Uh, so I wanna quickly talk about the process of preparing for annual town meeting. This process starts back in December. Really, we start preparing the omnibus budget, uh, predicting our revenues and seeking requests from departments and committee members uh, back in December. In January, uh, citizen petitions and committee requests for warrant articles uh, are due by January 31st per the Nahant Town Charter. And a, on the nahant.org website, you can download that form for a citizen petition. There's some guidance as to how you go about that process. And certainly the town clerk is always available uh, for questions. And then January through April is really the marathon of getting everything ready for town meeting. And that involves the board of selectmen, myself, the um, town accountant, department heads, uh, putting together our budget, it involves the Community Preservation Committee going through uh, applications submitted to them and the Finance Committee, most of all the Finance Committee, you know, absorbing all that information, writing recommendations, putting together the book and having it prepared to be sent off to the printer so it can be printed and put in the mail and delivered to doorsteps uh, a week prior to town meeting. So there's multiple different committees, different groups of people working together at the same time um, and kind of sending information from one committee to another. Um, some people may not know this, but uh, the omnibus budget that's voted on at town meeting is actually the finance committee's budget. They receive the first draft from the selectmen, which is prepared by the selectmen, myself, and the town accountant after speaking to department heads. 
but actually when we once we send it to the finance committee they control the budget and they have the right or the authority to make changes how they see fit and that's the budget that you as a resident actually vote on at town meeting um opposite of that the town warrant is controlled by the selectmen so only timely filed citizen petitions or committee requests uh outside of those two things the board of selectmen dictate what articles will appear on the warrant and when it comes to citizen requests uh, those citizen petitions, we don't control the language. Whatever was submitted timely with the appropriate number of signatures, the language of that article gets in, implant, uh, implemented into the warrant. We can't change that language. Um, and I'll bring that, I'll talk about that later because we actually have a citizen petition uh, this year that we ran into some language issues and we ended up presenting our own article with it. So, um, and then in May, the report and recommendations of the advisory finance committee is delivered to every household of a registered voter in town. Uh, building the omnibus budget is a very um, extensive process. And I think it can be somewhat uh, daunting or uh, challenging to understand when you only see it once a year, but it's really, it's really no different than the way you manage your own personal finances. Um, you know, the, the, for our fiscal year starts July 1st and goes to June 30th. The money that comes into the town starting July 1st is the money that is spent starting July 1st. So the same year, money in is money out. It's that cash flow happens in the same fiscal calendar. Um, and at town meeting, what you are doing as a, as a voter is saying, this is how much money I'm approving the town to spend on such item. And then it's up to the town to collect the revenue that allows us to spend that much and we can't exceed that amount. Uh, so the first step we really look at, like I said, back in, you know, end of December or so, is we start, the town accountant, myself, we start predicting our revenues for the upcoming fiscal year. So we're looking at what are we going to bring in through property taxes? Uh, what are we going to, what do we estimate to bring in through local receipts, through fine, uh, state aid, you know, all those different revenues. Um, free cash is one of them. Free cash uh, is a surplus of, of money into our budget that actually comes from a previous fiscal year. And what it's made up of is the difference between uh, more money than you, more money in revenue that you predicted. So you pull, you brought money more money than you thought you were going to into the into the revenues of the town and less money that you spent so if you were planning to spend a million and you were planning to bring in a million and you only spent 900 and you brought in 1.1 there's a two hundred thousand dollar difference there that would be your free cash free cash uh there's some very uh, specific guidance from the Department of Revenue as to how you should use that money. It's similar as a it's similar to like a uh, a Christmas bonus where you don't know how much it's going to be. It only comes once a year, so you don't want to spend free cash on repeated costs, things that occur annually, like payroll, ben employee benefits. You know things that are costs that are always going to be there. You want to spend it on one-time things like buying a piece of capital equipment, putting money into your savings account. For us, that's called stabilization, paying down uh, debt. You know, so those are the things you want to use stable, uh, use free cash for. And that's how we do it in our budget. 
So in the beginning of the year, we start predicting revenues. We predict how much free cash are we going to get? How much are we going to get through property taxes? For Nahant, because Nahant is 98% residential, and because there's a Proposition 2.5 law, our most concrete revenue being property taxes can only increase 2.5% total compared to last year. So we're very limited on how much our budget can grow. And we wanna keep that in mind when we're dealing with the omnibus budget that we're not exceeding that growth of revenue in our spending plan. So if our biggest source of revenue can only grow two and a half percent from year to year total, then the expenditures that we use that money for really should stay between two and a half and three and a half three and a half percent over last year. So when we're talking about payroll, when we're talking about employee benefits, um, you know, uh, expenses like fuel and keeping the electricity and heat, you know, those things that happen every year, we want to make sure that the total amount of that expense is somewhere between two and a half and three and a half percent growth over last year. That would be a, that's a healthy way of building your budget. So once we figure out, once we start predicting our revenues, we reach out to our department heads and ask them for what their capital requests are. We ask them for what budget increases they might need. And we start putting all that stuff together. And when we start developing the omnibus budget, we start by prioritizing um, certain expenses and we, and, we, and we build this budget by funding them at, there at the minimum. And then we'll come back and add more to it if we have extra funds after everything else. So the first thing we look at is debt. How much money do we owe in loans? You know, how much outstanding debt do we have? What's our minimum payment that we are required to pay this year? Whatever that amount is, let's, we're going to start with that. The next is stabilization. That's our, that's our savings account, essentially. Um, we're trying to build our stabilization account to be 5% of our total budget, which is around $700,000. That's the recommended amount. This year's stabilization article will put us there. We, we honestly want to double it. We want to get to like 10%, but with 5%, we're at the recommended level. We're in a really good position. Uh, so we have a policy that we've agreed with the finance committee as to how much we're going to put into stabilization every year. And the minimum amount is $100,000. So when we start building this budget, 100 grand goes to stabilization. Other post-employment benefits, these are employee benefits for retired employees. Uh, this account, your balance in this account does have an impact on your, um, on your bond rating. So it's important that we continue to put, we continue to build because it's a liability for the town. Um, our policy for OPEB is $25,000 on an annual uh, basis. Then the next thing we look at is what are our contractual obligations for the upcoming year? How much are we going to owe in employee contracts, union contracts, other type of service contracts, things that we're locked into? So we put those numbers in. And then we look at assessments like school, like MWRA on the water side, uh, like Lynn Water and sewer treatment plant on the sewer side. And we look at those minimums, we put that in. After those priorities are funded at their minimum, we then review those requests that came in through departments and committees. And we try to satisfy, we, we have multiple meetings with them. We try to satisfy as many of those as we can. And if any of those requests are good expenditures, to be funded with free cash, we'll fund it, we'll fund it with free cash. Um, anything left over at the end will come back to these priorities. So like I said, you know, 
Well, I'll get it. I'll get into it to the next the next slide. There's a lot of lot of information here. This this basically is the result of the process that I talked about in the previous slide. Um, our omnibus budget this year is only a 2.9% increase for the salaries and general operating expenses. So for those consistent expenditures that happen year after year, we're at 2.9. And as I said before, you really wanna be between two and a half and three and a half. So we're in a very uh, healthy position of only increasing that by $278,000. And then we have, I have it broken down there into general government, public safety, school, public works, cultural recreation. Um, the big decrease there uh, for cultural and recreation is really uh, because our costs associated with military housing is expected to go down because of last year's article. Um, and then in water and sewer enterprise, we have a, a decent, uh, significant decrease there because Linwater Sewer signed their new long-term operating maintenance contract and it ended up, ended up coming in less than what they expected. So last year we had built a higher increase in because it wasn't signed yet and we didn't know what that number was gonna be. Now we know it and it's less than what we expected. So we're in good shape. We actually can reduce. Um, reduce that. Uh, the next uh, part here is, like I mentioned, appropriately using free cash. So 100% of, of the free cash total, which this year is quite high, 1.5 million, is being used to pay for one-time expenditures, funding capital projects, or replenishing those other reserves. And a lot of the reason why that free cash dollar amount is about double than what we usually have is because a couple budgets ago, we were really using a lot of COVID money and spending less because of the shutdown that it created this flow of free cash. Um, so as I talked about the stabilization, that's one of those reserve accounts. This year we're putting, it's, you know, as I mentioned, we, our goal is $100,000 a year. This year we're putting $250,000 in. Because we have so much extra free cash, we're in a, we are in a position to put twice as much as we usually do, or two and a half times what we usually do, uh, which is going to bring our stabilization account to $669,000, uh, $670,000 about, which... In 2018, this account only had 90 something thousand dollars in it. So that is a huge victory for our community. That puts us pretty, pretty darn close to uh, 5%. It um, stabilizes our bond rating, which is, you know, our bond rating is just like your credit score. So having a good bond rating means you're going to get lower interest rates when you go to borrow for things. So, you know, stabilizing that account or, or that bond rating by doing by putting funds into this and into OPEB is, is essential for the town. And we're putting 25,000 into OPEB again. That account in 2018 only had about $3,000 in it. And it, after this year, it'll have 103 thousand dollars. So we have prioritized these two accounts. We've made significant investment in them and they're building and it's a very good story for the town. Um, and then debt. Uh, I talked about debt. Debt's the first thing we look at. So this year, our total debt appropriation is just over $2 million, which is $325,000 above the minimum amount due. So what we do is, you know, similar like you would, you look at all your outstanding loans, um, you see the ones with the highest interest rates and you pay those down first. And when you have this extra funds, it goes right to principal. So it's no different than, you know, you trying to pay down a credit card that has the most, the highest interest rate first. Uh, 
so now I'm going to get into a few of the different Warren articles. The biggest, uh, most important article that we have is Article 17, which has to do with sewer infrastructure. This is, uh, this is like um, twilight zone for me, in a sense. <laughs> Uh, we have, have come to the town meeting over the last few years and asked for authorization for borrowing for sewer um, uh, quite a couple of times now. But what's different this year is we've actually been included, we've been awarded through the DEP's um, intended use plan for the Clean Water uh, Trust State Revolving Fund, um, almost $16 million dollars. Now that is a long-term low interest loan program. And because we have that award, uh, authorizing the town's ability to accept that borrowing capacity is the next step. And if we pass this article, we, kind of, we, we almost like hold on to that, our place in the program for that amount of money. If we don't pass this article, we risk uh, losing either all or a portion of that award. So uh, the other benefit of this article is, or the way that this program works, is it's similar to a construction loan where the money doesn't actually get borrowed until the project is done. So as we do a project, we get reimbursed through the program for the invoices that we pay. And then when the pot project's completed, they bond us for the total cost of the project, long-term, very low interest, lower interest than if we were to borrow on our own. So with that, this article, even though it's for $18 million, it really sets us up for the, like the next 10 years. We don't, if this passes, the town isn't going to borrow eight, $18 million the next day or even in the next year and have to start paying debt on it. It's going to be segmented out based on the capital plan, which you can see below in this chart. So there's four different projects that are listed in, were listed in our application for the uh, Clean Water Trust program the Ward Road Pump Station. The Willow Road Force Main, Gravity II, which is um, essentially breaks in gravity sewer lines uh, where clean water is getting in, um, or illicit connections. You know, people pumping uh, like a like a basement sump pump into the sewer system, or having a downspout go into uh, the sewer system, those sorts of things. And then the causeway force main. Right now we're doing the, Lin if, you, if you've been stuck in traffic coming home from uh, Boston on the Linway, it's because of the project we're currently doing on the, on the Linway that goes from the rotary to the Linwater sewer treatment plant. That project, it will be substantially complete by the end of June. And then find like 100% complete a year later when they come back and do the final paving. But we will be onto the new pipe and off of the uh, bypass, which is above ground, by the summer. Uh, once that project is done, then we start, then we go and borrow, do get the bond for the total cost of that project, and we start paying debt on it next year. Um, the next big project is the Ward Road Pump Station. Uh, the, every component, every item from a light switch to the actual pump, to the pipes, uh, to uh, the HVAC system, everything in the Ward Road Pump Station essentially had like a 25 year lifespan and we're, in, we're on year like 41 or 42. Uh, so very, very overdue. The good news is we've gotten a lot out of the station, um, but we've been basically band-aiding it for the last 10 years, spending a lot of money on that. Um, and, you know, it's time to invest, to seriously invest in the, uh, in that building. It's the, 
it's the heart of the system. Every time you turn your sink on, flush your toilet, take a shower, the water goes down the drain, it goes to the Ward Road pump station, and from there gets pumped out of town to Lynn for treatment. Uh, so this, this estimate of 5.32 is really high. It's a very, it's a conservatively high estimate because of the current supply chain issues. We actually don't expect it to be this expensive, but um, we're being cautious with hopefully supply chain issues resolve a little bit and the and prices come down. Uh, the next one is the force main that goes from the wharf basically to the golf course. So anything on that side of town, gravity feeds into the pump station right at the entrance of the wharf. It gets pumped down Willow Road past Tudor Beach to the golf course area. And then it gravity feeds to the Wood Road pump station. That pipe, uh, again, 25, 20 year lifespan. It's in, the, it's in its like 40 or 50 year range. Gravity II, I spoke about that already. Um, that is, you know, we're, when we have a heavy rainstorm, the volume of uh, wastewater in our system almost doubles. So it adds strain to the system. We're paying to clean water that doesn't need to be cleaned. And DEP, the state, is putting a lot of regulatory pressure on us and every community to fix these items. Good news is we've already uh, identified where the problems are and we've created a capital plan. Now the next step is to really start checking off some of the most critical repairs that were identified through that process. Um, and then lastly, the Causeway Force Main, it's the job we're doing now, but from the rotary back to the town, in relatively okay shape now. Um, not a lot of other utilities that, you know, causing it to corrode quickly, like on the windway, uh, pretty straight line. That's probably five to 10, probably closer to 10 years out before we do that work. So $18 million, big number, but sets us up for the next 10 years. Um, Article 20, fire truck. Uh, we have a need for a new fire truck in town. Um, the, the town of Nahant, due to uh, the hard work by uh, administrators in the fire department and the town hall, but mostly our current fire chief, Austin Antrim, um, hasn't spent a dollar, a dime on fire apparatus in decades. And we have two uh, beautiful new trucks, but per fire standards, we're supposed to have three. And the third truck that we have is very old, um, honestly dangerous to operate and is in need of replacement. Um, we wouldn't be eligible for another grant because the mean age of our of all of our apparatus is too high now because we have those two new trucks. So a new truck is somewhere between $700,000 dollars and $750,000. Um, so what we're asking the town is to authorize us to borrow for half. The other half, we're gonna use uh, ARPA funds, which is the American Rescue Plan Act. So because of COVID, many communities got funds from the federal government to help with um, a number of things related to COVID and general government assistance. Um, certainly public safety is one of those categories. So, you know, this is actually, it's a, it's, um, it's a big investment buying a new fire truck, one of the biggest for any community, uh, but for the town to only have to really pay for half of one in decades, it's a very successful story for us. Uh, Article 22, community preservation. The match from the state, really high this year. There's a ton of funds in the, commu in the community preservation uh, 
committee did a ton of work, received a bunch of applications, um, and there's quite a few different articles here and different projects. Community preservation funds are used for housing, for open space, recreation, or historical preservation. And really, the benefit of community preservation funds is that it gives us the opportunity to do projects that we, you know, more of like a, a want, not, not always, many of these are needs, but, you know, may not be critical to running a town. And so when you're very limited on your budget, you know, having CPC funds is incredibly useful and it gives us the opportunity to use those funds matched by state dollars to do projects that otherwise we might not be able to do. Uh, so it's a great program and the committee does a great job. I'll just run through a few of these. Um, the uh, Naha Historical Society submitted a eighteen and a half thousand uh, dollar application for um, preservation of records. <clears throat> uh, boat room doors at the life saving station, replacing them. Historical, uh, massive historical doors at the life historical life saving station. So funds to replace those. Um, ADA improvements for the village church, uh, planning for upgrades to the heritage trail from like Flash Road to the back of the Johnson School, technical assistance to develop a housing plan. This is a bit, this is an important one for the, for the town, for the Board of Selectmen. Uh, we submitted this application. The town currently um, may not meet its uh, 40B requirements and thus without meeting it where it could be subject to, you know, an only unfriendly affordable housing development, having a housing plan, you know, not only provides us some uh, temporary protections against that, but it also helps us identify ways to accomplish our own housing goals, which the town has many of them. You know, we have a lot of seniors that, are looking to downsize, but don't want to leave Nahat. We have a lot of young families that are looking to come to Nahat, but can't afford to do so. Um, we're obviously very, we don't have a lot of land that can be developed. So um, this would be to bring in, you know, technical assistance to help us approach all those housing related subjects, including the most recent MBTA multifamily zoning requirement, which we are currently awaiting new guidelines from DHCD, whatever they end up being, that would be uh, lumped into that process, should this pass. Um, acoustic and lighting ADA improvements. This one should be easy because we're going to be in the main hall and <laughs> it's, it's always hard to hear. Uh, and sometimes see in the main hall. So this, we actually brought in consultants that would help improve the heat, you know, the, uh, the sound quality in the room and the lighting quality. Um, borrowing 22H is funding. Uh, this article was up last year, it passed. We put the project out to bid the cost of the project exceeds the funding that was authorized last year. So this additional funding will allow us to continue and hopefully complete these projects. And Little Naha Playground uh, improvements, uh, improvements with vegetation at Bailey's Hill, a maintenance plan uh, for East Point, uh, restoring the flagpole here at the town hall. And the last ones are debt service payments and reverting unexpected funds, unexpended funds, excuse me. Uh, Article 24 is a public safety building. Public safety building study, feasibility study. <clears throat> Both, you know, just like a lot of our infrastructure around town, you know, our, our buildings are falling down and exceeding their life, life 
span as well. Uh, our fire station and our police station uh, are are inadequate, and the fire station is the fire station worse, I think, than the police station um, is in a lot of trouble. We've we've had to put a lot of money into these buildings to keep them safe for our employees. Um, at some point, the town needs to think about the long-term plan while also trying to extend the life of our current infrastructure. With the influx of free cash from this year, we're able to kind of do both. So we're putting money towards capital improvements that are gonna help extend the life of these buildings, um, but also money towards hiring a consultant to go through a legitimate feasibility study. And that study will look at, you know, um, where, how are the current buildings uh, inefficient? You know, why, wh what needs aren't they meeting? Does the town need um, two new buildings? Uh, does it need one new building combining the two, police and fire into a public safety building? Where would those be located? You know, a number of different things. Uh, the town, started this process a few years ago with like $14,000, but really all it did was kind of a needs assessment. Um, this is a little bit uh, more extended of a process. When you're looking at a new building like this, you're, it's a, I break it down into three phases. Phase one, this being the feasibility study. Phase two, once you decide what you wanna do, you go into a schematic design and permit. And then phase three is construction. We wouldn't go, we didn't feel comfortable asking for funds um, to go through design phase because we wanna know that we have support from the town after we go through the feasibility phase. So the first step, go through the feasibility study, very uh, robust public process, come to um, a common goal, and then ask the town for additional funding to move to phase two. Uh, climate change is the next uh, largest item in this, in this uh, town meeting <clears throat> warrant. This is the citizen petition, uh, Article 30. I'm sorry, Article 31, which isn't on this slideshow, was a citizen petition to improve the drainage in the lowlands area. The language of that citizen petition, which we can't change, was a bit restrictive. Uh, we actually have an engineer on uh, contract now, uh, paid for with funds approved at last year's town meeting, who's studying this uh, hydrology of the area, the uh, alternatives, alternatives of solutions that could be introduced to help improve uh, drainage in the area. We have two critical assets in the Ward Road pump station and the uh, National Grid electric substation down at Ward Road. So, and this being, the first part of Big Nahat, uh, when flooded, really makes public safety response difficult when it's flooded. So a critical area of town, uh, certainly we have stormwater issues all over town uh, identified in our MVP and hazard mitigation plans. This lowlands area, we currently have an engineer studying it. And what this Article 30 will fund are the recommendations that the engineer eventually uh, completes in June of this year. So if this gets approved, we'll have the we'll have the recommendations of the engineer in June, and uh, July one will be able to borrow and implement some of those recommendations. <clears throat> Article 29, the five hundred thousand dollars for climate change preparedness. This is. Um, this article is new to our community and probably new to met, like many communities, 
not a lot of towns approach it this way um, because the grant programs that are currently being funded or soon to be funded through ARPA funds, federal funding, uh, this huge influx of money um, for climate change is this new way of doing new way of doing business in a sense. And we're trying to set the town up to be eligible and competitive in applying for those funds. So many times those applications, you are required as a town to match a certain percentage of the total cost of the project. And when you go to apply, if you already have uh, those funds approved or appropriated at town meeting, it makes your application more competitive. Um, Typically, towns will go to a town meeting and say, you know, we have X project or Y project. Uh, this is how much it's going to cost. This is how much we plan to apply for. So this is how much we need in local match. What we're going to the town saying is just approve us the ability to borrow $500,000. We'll use that money for technical assistance in achieving or pursuing these grants and loans for these projects and for our match side of the project. So we, the 500, we can actually, we can actually use it for multiple grant programs, multiple projects related to climate change. We have an application that we're filing in June for the Short Beach Dune that is $3.25 million at a 10% match is $325,000 to the town. If this were to pass, we can include that in our application in June and say, we already have our money appropriated. Plus we have leftover funds that, you know, outside of the state match that we could use for another grant program through coastal zone management to get other projects done. So, this is um, this is really important for the town. Obviously, Nahant climate change is massive uh, issue for us. Really, was a number one priority for us prior to COVID um, and going through the pandemic. So we're kind of bringing it back to the forefront and trying to prepare for sea level rise that's predicted to be a foot over the next uh, you know twenty five to fifty years. So. Um, very important article uh, out of all of them on the, on the warrant. I think that's my last slide. It is. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing and ask anybody on the call if they have any question or comment. I can pull up slides again if you want me to go back to anything. Hi, B. If the unmute. I got it. I got it. Um, yeah, I just I was a little confused about your the the lowlands drainage. Uh, you've explained twenty nine. It was thirty and thirty one. I think you said the citizens petition asked for funding for lowlands drainage. I just I was just looking at it, but I hadn't read it before. And you said the article just before that is also addressing that so are you saying that if we pass 30 we won't need 31 or if we yes. really want to focus that money on the lowlands we should vote for 31 and not fund 30 Can, just explain the the relationship yes. between those two because i yes. know they they got a last year there was a lowlands drainage article that was withdrawn because the town substituted one and yes. I don't know what pro progress has been made with that, but. Um, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, Thank you get you. it, what my question is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let me pull up the final warrant here, hold on. And I'll share my screen.
Okay. Can you see that? Oh, you got your book. Okay. So last year, <clears throat> same scenario. Citizen petition came in for, I think, $100,000. And the language of that article was restrictive and identified a certain solution that hasn't been vetted by an engineer and, you know, the, could have, the number, you know, really didn't, the number didn't come from an engineer. So, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was problematic the way it was written, but the town, you know, this has been a priority since I started from the previous selectmen to the current selectmen, you know, this has been a big issue for us. So even though we were, even though we were in line with the neighborhood, the petition that came in, the language of it was problematic and we can't change that once it comes in. So last year we put in an article uh, right next to theirs that um, was for the same amount of money, but the language was a little bit more broad. And we asked that folks support the town's article and then they did, it passed, and then the residents withdrew the citizen petition. We've, we've uh, hired Dubois and King, uh, this unbelievable stormwater engineering firm, uh, to come out to town. Basically, they've been doing surveying. They've been looking at past plans, looking at um, different reports. They are going through this process and their scope of services is uh, included in a slideshow that's on the hot.org that I'll show you how to get to it. But um, we've had a couple neighborhood meetings with the engineer and the residents there. Uh, they're going to be completed with their prod, with their engineering study and assessment in June. And they're looking at, you know, what the current first thing they're doing is surveying the entire area. And they're kind of identifying or what they'd be able to do with that is kind of create a model of where the water is gonna go when it floods and you know how much flooding is gonna inundate which areas of the lowlands. I mean, it's incredible stuff. And then what they're gonna do is introduce different solutions into that model and see how it provides value to the neighborhood. So one of them is restoring the outfall pipe on Castle Road that goes out to Doggy Beach. One is um, improving flow or drainage uh, with, the, with the ditch system and you know the, the pumps from Bear Pond. Another is creating a potential like mini bear pond with a permanent pump in the lowlands area. Um, and then we gave them kind of broad range to think of any other solution that you know could potentially be possible. They will also bring in uh, DEP, Army Corps engineers, um, CZM, um, MEMA, like all these different agencies and find out if they have programs that would help fund or pursue some of the solutions that they identify in their study. So it's, you know, we're definitely spending a lot of money on studying and planning, but it's important that we get this right because um, it's so critical. So like now fast forward to this year, um, citizen petition came in again, you know, well, it's, it's for low forward. <laughs> So it's 400,000, you know, it identifies, you know, first of all, it says, and, I, and I, I, I'm careful about like um, speaking, you know, badly about a citizen's petition because, you know, they put the effort in, they got the signatures, they've been part of the process with us, we're supportive. Um, but just as an example, if you read article 31, it says $400,000 to repair, restore, improve drainage in the lowlands by replacing, repairing, constructing the existing Castle Road storm drain and installing a permanent fixed pump. Uh, 
you know, right out of the, right there, like it's not a storm drain. That's the problem. It's an outfall pipe. So that language mm. could be so restrictive that we would only be able to spend money on the drain, you know, that's at the street and not so much the pipe, the outfall pipe. Two, it's saying that we have to install a permanent fixed pump, which may not be even permittable under S, uh, under MS4 EPA. Mm outflow uh pipe regulation so yeah. however that concept is being vetted by the engineer and could be a solution that we pursue um or a form of it of some sort so article 30 the one above it we actually do a little bit more money five hundred fifty thousand, and it is a little bit more broadly worded and it's to fund drainage improvements in the lowlands neighborhood generally consisting of Cass Road, Fox Hill Road and Ward Road, including but not limited to improvements to existing infrastructure of drainage ditches, stormwater pipes, outfalls, as well as development of infrastructure to improve drainage or take any other action. So it's a little bit more broader, mm -hmm. allows us to kind of really go with what the engineer recommends. So you know, we've, but I, we we passed something last year. How long have they been studying it? And is there any way of building in? I mean, this is not, you know, you know, it's not my neighborhood, but it seems to me that I, I totally get that we shouldn't approve an article that that requires something which might not be the best solution. I completely understand that. Yeah. But I'd love to see something in maybe in Article 30 that says something about when action will start. Because it, you know, it seems like referred to a study. We all know that that's a technique, right? So, and I, I'm not saying I think that yeah. we're committed to getting it done, but I'd love to see something that says, a study's being done, we're going to get results by X, we're going to make some decisions, we're going to start. That's all. I mean, that's, yeah. that's my point. So we've, uh, we've had that discussion a lot more like on the local level with the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate that comment. I, we haven't really talked, we haven't really talked more about it, like outside of that local neighborhood. Hmm. Um, well, they're the ones, you know, if you, the, yeah. so like we've, we, the engineer, you know, I have the scope, I could, it's, it's, if the scope isn't uploaded yet, I, I have it copied and pasted in that PowerPoint, which is online, I should upload oh. the full scope that has those dates and those trigger points, but they're scheduled to be completed by June with their recommendations. So, um, you know, it certainly has been taking some time because that got, so that got approved back in May last year. The money doesn't become available until July. We, you know, we probably honestly didn't have the capacity to start searching for firms until mm. like August or September. And, you know, we, we interviewed quite a different, you know, I think we've reached out to three or four different firms and, talk to other towns and, you know, try to get some, we really wanted to hire the right people. So mm. that was a little bit of a process. The folks we hired, um, you know, have been great to work with. And a lot of the initial phase was getting them to understand this area, having them review previous plans and designs and ideas and reports and studies and kind of map this whole thing out. Um, you know, so yeah, it's been taking some time, but you know, I, I'm confident in them and hopefully we have that report by June. And then if this passes, we can, you know, immediately start the process, but it's very possible that some of those solutions are going to require extensive permitting, which, mm -hmm. you know, the MEPA process alone, if you have to go through MEPA, that could be anywhere from 12 to 14 months. So oh, even, you know, even if 
you know, the best solution that's going to provide the most value that's uh, going to be the answer to most of our problems, if it requires a lot of permitting, we might not be putting shovels in the ground for another year. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's just the process of having to, you know, get things permitted correctly. So um, we'll see. We'll see how we go. But that's so, uh, yeah, we'll be asking people to support 30 and then withdraw 31. I, I understand. But I appreciate your comments, B, because that helps me understand uh, what people are thinking and what the perspective is of people. I'm in this stuff every day. So thank you for asking the question. Okay, thank you for giving a comprehensive answer. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, and the, uh, the study, you know, part of that study too is gonna, part of the deliverables of those studies is gonna include the estimates for the permitting cost and time frame too. So it'll it'll evaluate those solutions and kind of put them in order of what do they cost? How long are they gonna take the permit? What value are they gonna provide to the neighborhood? You know, that sort of thing, so. Um, anybody else have questions or comments or feedback or anything? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me. Um, again, I'll be doing this again on Monday night and I will, uh, add this recording to nahat.org. Uh, please visit, you know, go to the homepage, click on the annual town meeting link. There's a ton of information there. Good night, everyone.